Saturation in qualitative research usually means a point where adding more data in the terms of interviews or focus groups, or doing more analysis, adding more cones and themes, isn't adding anything new and useful to the project. And yes, there are different kinds of saturation. The first and most common that people talk about is data saturation. And that's when adding more data sources, so doing more interviews or more focus groups, isn't adding any new insights to the data. The kind of things that people are saying are the kind of things that people have said before. You can think about saturation a little bit in the same way that you soak up water with a sponge. There comes a point with a sponge where if you add more water, the sponge just doesn't have any more capacity to soak up anymore and it just starts to flow through or flow off. The second aspect is saturation of codes and themes, and that's where doing more analysis of the data, so reading it in different ways, reading it more deeply, isn't adding any new kind of ways that you can see patterns and trends emerging in the data. And so combine these two things are usually used to define when to stop recruiting for a project, so when you don't need to interview or talk to more people, and when you're ready, especially with the coding aspect of it, and ready to develop those larger themes and try and answer the research questions. But let's think a little bit about what actually would be getting saturated here. Is it your brain? Is it that you just kind of can't think about anything more? Is the research project got so complicated and there are so many different things and topics being said that you can't keep track of them anymore? Well, that would be a good point to use a tool like Quercos to help you kind of keep track of your themes and the data that's coming from them. But both of these concepts are a little bit problematic and need to be used very carefully if that's the approach you want to take. In qualitative research, we're not usually looking for consensus. We're not trying to get to a stage where everybody that we've spoken to agrees with something. And we're usually asking the kinds of questions where people are going to respond in different ways and based on their life experience, they're going to have very different things to tell us. And so it's rarely the case that speaking to a new person won't give us anything completely new. Now, it may be that the main themes, the main issues keep coming up again and again, and we're not discovering new things. But you may find, for example, that although you've done four interviews in a row and the same things were coming up in those four, it would have been the fifth interview where people said something completely different. And we could start describing this as premature saturation. And this is where we didn't realize it, but in fact, there was a lot more to discover. And there are various different factors that can make it seem like we've reached saturation when we haven't. A very important one of these may be that we're just talking to the same kinds of people over and over. We're not asking different kinds of people. We're not getting a great diversity in our sample. The other thing is that we may not be asking questions in a good way. For example, if you ask people whether they like ice cream, you'll probably get a bunch of very plain yes or no answers, probably a lot of yeses. You're not giving them very much space to explain why. If you just ask a question like, why do you like ice cream, then you can get responses that you might not have anticipated. Yes, it's about the flavour, possibly things like mouthfeel, but then also things like if the particular producer has an ethical stance on sourcing their products. There are also concepts like theoretical saturation. Remember, in a lot of qualitative research, we don't know what the answers are going to be. We're using them to generate new theory in approaches like grounded theory. Saturation is discussed by Strauss and Glazer, some of the earliest works in grounded theory and qualitative analysis. But it's also a concept which a lot of authors find problematic, not only because there can be a very positivistic view that research is done, and often with certain types of difficult questions, research is never done. It can also be seen as positivistic in that it leads to a particular set sample size. And there are several different authors who provide good critiques of saturation, which you should probably have a look at. And there'll be links to some of these in the descriptions below. But these kind of positivistic terms may not apply to your epistemology or ontology, depending what kind of qualitative research you're doing and what kinds of questions you want to explore. But in the same way that a sponge, when it's completely dry, really doesn't absorb any water, it's important that we are immersed in our data, that we've read the transcripts of the interview summaries and the focus groups that we have to make sure that we understand a little bit. Otherwise, we can't see when data is saturated uh, and when commonalities are coming out of the different things that people say. You need to be doing the analysis as you go along. 
A lot of qualitative research projects take this approach where they collect some data, analyze it, and then go and collect some more. It's often described as constant comparative analysis and grounded theory and a lot of other approaches suggest this to make sure that if there are interesting things coming out of the data, you make sure you can ask those things to the other respondents and you can see if there are gaps in the data and talk to different types of people or ask different questions that might elicit answers from the next people that you speak to. But in most qualitative analysis projects, these things should be quite cyclical. The data collection should be feeding to the analysis. The analysis should be feeding into the data collection. Sometimes saturation is almost used as an excuse in public articles as to why that particular sample size was used. Um, you'll see people just say, well, we reached saturation point. When in fact, we just have to acknowledge the practical realities of doing qualitative research. There are always restrictions on the amount of time and money that we have available to spend on a project. Recruiting more people is expensive um, and the time required from the researchers may be fixed. You may need to go on to another project. You may have a deadline for a master's or a PhD project. And these realities more often set the end point of research than any kind of concept like saturation. So this was a very brief overview of saturation in qualitative research. If you want to find out more, there's a blog post linked here, which has got a lot more detail and also some of the references that we've discussed here and some of the critiques of using saturation within qualitative research. You'll also be able to find more information about Quercos, our simple tool for doing qualitative analysis that helps you keep track of all your codes and themes as you go through and understand and interpret your data and your transcripts. And it can be a really useful tool to help you either recognize when saturation occurs or not to worry particularly about that endpoint. So thanks for watching. Do like and subscribe. Uh, try Quercos out and look at some of our other resources if you want to learn anything else about qualitative research.